Hello there, United States history students. I hope you are having a wonderful day. This is a recorded slideshow lecture on the story of Theodore Roosevelt. I'm your teacher, Mr. Endress. Hey, let's learn something. All right, so there aren't too many of these lectures that are exclusively about one individual. I personally love biography, and I think biography more than anything else makes history come alive. And so we certainly learn a lot of, about a lot of individuals, but never in this much depth. But there were very few Americans in our country's history who were so singularly dynamic in changing the course of our country's history, and especially on setting our country's course in a particular direction in the 20th century than that of Theodore Roosevelt. He could be considered a great person in history, because he was so influential, but you know, he was still a human being like the rest of us. He had good qualities, he had bad qualities, he had annoying qualities, and he had inspirational qualities. And I, as your teacher, I'm going to do my very best to tell Theodore Roosevelt's story as honestly as possible, so that you are well educated in how he influenced the course of our country's history. And I hope to give you a, a very honest portrait of who he was as an individual as well. All right, so let's begin. And I always enjoy beginning the story of Theodore Roosevelt by talking about slang in American history. Yes, slang. Slang is always an interesting development in the evolution of any language. And sometimes a slang word is a new word that comes along, but more often than not, it's an old word, sometimes a really old word, that is used in a new way, in a new context, to develop a new meaning. So, for example, in the 1950s, in the late 1950s, there was a new form of jazz that came around, developed mostly by Miles Davis, called cool jazz. And then from there, this word exploded into being used by anybody who just wants to describe something nice. Hey, we're learning about the story of Theodore Roosevelt today? Hey, that's cool. In the 1980s, you had surfers in Southern California who took a very old word, awesome, a word that, if you take it all the way back, had some religious overtones, and they start using this word, and the greater American culture picks up on it, and now how many times do you use this word, awesome, every day? How many times do you use the word, cool, every day? And you use these words because of jazz musicians in New York City in the late 1950s, and surfers in Southern California in the early 1980s made these words possible. What do you think about the history of American slang? I personally think it's cool and awesome. You know what else I think it is? I think it's bully. Yeah, that's right, bully. This was Theodore Roosevelt's favorite slang term, a slang term that was around in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, and not around much that much anymore, unless, you know, one of you guys take to it and you want to bring it back make the declaration of bully popular again. Bully was something that Theodore Roosevelt and I guess a few others back at this point in time in history would exclaim when they were having a really good time. Theodore Roosevelt went on his very first airplane ride. The airplane was had just recently been invented in the early 20th century. And supposedly while he was up there with the pilot who's spitting Theodore Roosevelt around in the air, Theodore Roosevelt kept crying, Bully! Bully! This is bully! So there you go. Bully. So that's the first thing I like teaching about Theodore Roosevelt. A little history of slang. But as I get into the entire arc of his whole life, you're going to see that Theodore Roosevelt lived his life in a very different way than most people choose to live their lives. And for me personally, this is what makes Theodore Roosevelt an exceptional human being. And I think in this particular way, a human being that most of us can look up to and emulate. Theodore Roosevelt, throughout his life, embraced a particular philosophy of living. Later on in his life, as an adult man, he gave a name to this particular philosophy, this particular lifestyle. He called it the strenuous life. So let me try to explain in my own words what the strenuous life was. As most of us go through our days, most of us seek comfort and convenience. When we think about the work that we have to do, we think, well, let's get this done as quickly and as efficiently as we possibly can. 
As we think about ways to pass our free time, we think about the most comfortable, enjoyable activities to us personally. This seems to be rather natural, and most of us have it in our head that doing these comfortable and convenient things will create the overall effect of happiness. That's how I think most people approach life and living from day to day to day. Not Theodore Roosevelt. His philosophy of the strenuous life is the exact op opposite of living a life of comfort and convenience. Roosevelt's particular perspective on how to live a happy life was to intentionally seek out challenges. Find something that's difficult for you to do and then do it. And when you do it, you're probably going to fail because it's too difficult for you. But there's joy and honor in the attempt. And then, you never know, you might succeed at something that you found to be painfully difficult. That's the philosophy of the strenuous life. Now, those are my own words. Here are Theodore Roosevelt's own words. These words come from a speech that Theodore Roosevelt gave, and it's probably one of the most often quoted speeches of Theodore Roosevelt's life. I even see this a lot today with self-development authors. This particular quote certainly hasn't lost its popularity over the course of over a hundred years since Theodore Roosevelt first spoke these words. But here is the quote. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. So that's how Theodore Roosevelt explained the strenuous life in his famous Man in the Arena speech. So how did Theodore Roosevelt come to embrace such an interesting and personally challenging philosophy that he lived by his entire life? Well, his childhood had a lot to do with that. Let's start there. Theodore, was born, Theodore Roosevelt was born and raised in Manhattan, New York City. He was born in the year 1858. He was raised in a fairly well-off household. The Roosevelts were wealthy. Mom was from the South. She was a proper Southern socialite. His dad, whose name was also Theodore Roosevelt, was a wealthy and prominent man in Manhattan who even had some connection with Abraham Lincoln. Theodore Roosevelt did not have an easy childhood. He was born a rather sick and frail young man. He had asthma. Now, most of you are familiar with what asthma is. It is a respiratory illness. You have it your entire life. And poor young Theodore Roosevelt would have these asthma attacks. For a young boy, they were extraordinarily scary. If you ever want a sense of what an asthma attack feels like, go outside, sprint for a couple hundred yards as fast as you can, then stop, pinch your nose, and try breathing through a straw. You can't get enough air and you feel like you're going to die. As a young toddler, little Theodore Roosevelt was experiencing these things. And it was his dad who typically comforted him. It was his dad who would take him, hold him on his lap, comfort young Theodore Roosevelt, pet him, and encourage him to just relax, breathe slow, relax, breathe slow. So Theodore Roosevelt grew up in Manhattan, which, you know, you think of Manhattan today, you think, well, it's the big city. And Manhattan was a big city back then, but there was still, still a lot of green space and there was some property. They had some property. And, nature, and Theodore Roosevelt grew up in nature. His dad would sometimes take him on long horseback rides, just trying to get young Theodore Roosevelt to relax and breathe slow and breathe in the air. And this worked. So in, in a day and age before medicinal inhalers, Theodore Roosevelt's dad essentially was teaching him the power of his mind to control his body. 
And when the asthma attacks hit, Theodore Roosevelt throughout his life learned how to sort of go to this comfortable place, remember his dad and the comfort his dad provided him and the long walks in the woods and calm his body until the asthma attack passed. Young Theodore Roosevelt was physically very frail. He was not a strong boy. He was a small, weak boy. He had bad lungs. He had bad eyes. But he was a smart kid. He enjoyed reading a lot as a young boy. And then one day during his, in his childhood, Theodore Roosevelt's dad came home with a gift. And the gift was a set of weights. And they had this father-son heart-to-heart where Theodore Roosevelt Sr. told young Theodore Roosevelt, you've got a strong mind, but a weak body. You cannot go through life with a weak body. Therefore, your mind must make your body. So young Theodore Roosevelt started lifting weights. And when he hit puberty in his early teens, he started going to a boxing gym in New York City. Literally just walked in asking him to box other teens and young men who were much bigger and much stronger than him. He would box these boys and young men. He would lose, but he kept coming back because of the sheer joy of the challenge. Now, students, that is Theodore Roosevelt. You understand that aspect of his personality. You got pretty much the whole story in terms of everything else that he does. Everything else that he does throughout his whole life and as president of the United States, it starts to fall into place once you understand this attitude of, hey, if it's challenging, if it's difficult, I want to do it. That's Theodore Roosevelt. As a young man, and this is very important to know about him, he loved nature. He spent long hours out in nature. This is the middle of the 19th century. There's no, there are no movies, internet, television. There's no radio around. He reads books and spends time in nature, falls in love with birds, keeps a journal where he draws birds, listens to bird sounds, bird songs rather, challenges himself to be able to identify songs or to identify birds by their songs. He finds dead animals of all sorts and starts bringing, him back, bringing them back to his room where he enjoys dissecting them. In the Roosevelt Mansion in downtown Manhattan, I, this scared several servants who were there doing the cleaning that came across all these carcasses of, of animals that Theodore Roosevelt had pulled back into his room. But he's fascinated by nature. And throughout his life, as we'll see, Theodore Roosevelt sought comfort and saw the value in wild, untamed nature. All right, so as he makes his way through his teenage years, he actually becomes a very strong young man. He came from a wealthy family, like I said, and when he was 17 years old, he took a trip to Central Europe. He climbed mountains in Austria. So he's tough by the time he's uh, getting ready to go to college, and he's smart, smart, smart. So he ends up going to Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Before he left home in New York to go to Harvard, his dad gave him three rules to live by. He said, these are the rules that you should follow. These are priorities, and you should follow these rules in this order. First, be a good and moral person. Be nice, be kind, be fair. Do good things for people. That's what you do first. Second, mind your health. Be healthy. And then only after minding those first two priorities, be a good student. Sadly, during the course of the four years that Theodore Roosevelt is getting his undergraduate degree at Harvard University, his dad passed away. Theodore Roosevelt would remember his dad as the greatest man I ever knew. Certainly much of what Theodore Roosevelt became in his life was inspired by his dad's teachings. Now, while he's at Harvard, we have our first reports first historical documentation of one of Theodore Roosevelt's most annoying qualities. The man never shut up. He wanted to talk, 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 and he wanted to dominate any conversation. If I had the opportunity personally to go back in time and, theater, and meet Theodore Roosevelt, man, I'd do it in a heartbeat, but I think I'd spend a few minutes with him and then I'd, I'd just get really annoyed with him because by every description of him, he would meet you, he would shake at your hand, and he would talk to you and he would not shut up. People would spend 15 minutes in a room with him and they'd walk out of the room looking like they got hit by a tornado. 
because he's loud, he's boisterous, and he just talks. He dominates every conversation. You don't get a word in. And he doesn't care. And this first came out as a student in Harvard, where he had to be reminded, you are a student, not a professor. When you're in class, the professors are the ones who teach, not you. So Theodore Roosevelt had this obnoxious quality. Now, while he was at Harvard, he actually took philosophy classes from one of the greatest philosophers in all of American history. And he's actually the father of American psychology. His name was William James, and Theodore Roosevelt, it it was one of the few classes where Theodore Roosevelt was quiet in because he himself was in awe of William James. And after his four years at Harvard, Theodore Roosevelt said, the greatest professor I had at, at Harvard, hands down, William James. Now, outside of classes at Harvard, Theodore Roosevelt was very active, go figure. He joined the crew team at Harvard. So he probably spent a lot of time rowing his boat on the Charles River. We don't have any pictures, at least I have never seen any pictures, of Theodore Roosevelt on the crew team at Harvard, but we do have a picture that we see here. Theodore Roosevelt was a member of the Harvard Boxing Club. And if you're able to look at this particular picture, you see Theodore Roosevelt, uh, when he's a college kid, is no longer a scrawny little boy. He's turning into a little beefcake. And Theodore Roosevelt is smart. His senior year at Harvard, he did a lot of research on naval warfare. And he ends up writing his senior thesis on the naval war of 1812. So how the Americans and the British fought each other during the war of 1812. In this particular book, he doesn't just describe what happened and the tactics that were used, but he identifies principles of tactics that work. And this this senior thesis, this paper, which was a monumentally long essay, was so well-researched and and so well-written that it became a published book. So Theodore Roosevelt gets his degree from Harvard, and already at age 22, he's a published author. And this book starts being read and used in classes at our Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. So Theodore Roosevelt's never been in the military. He's never been in the Navy. Yet he writes a book at age 22 that is read and studied by naval commanders to identify principles they can use in future combat. It's also at Harvard that he falls in love for the first time. Ah, but this is love Theodore Roosevelt style. Theodore Roosevelt had his own particular way of dating when he was a young man. I'll describe what he did and I'll let you evaluate what you think of it. Now, Theodore Roosevelt had dated when he was in high school. He had a girlfriend named Edith, but things didn't really develop much with Edith. So when he gets to Harvard and he decides, okay, I'm going to become a man and I'm going to have a wife and I'm going to have a great life, he doesn't wait for love to come to him. He goes out and finds his love. So he would literally sit in the commons area of Harvard. He would sit on a bench and watch the the students walk by. He waited till he found the most beautiful woman, somebody who he thought, yes, there she is, my goddess, my wife. And once he identified who he thought to be the most beautiful woman on the campus of Harvard, he would pursue her relentlessly. And so here she is, this poor woman. She she was your stereotypical beauty. She was tall, blonde hair, blue eyes statuesque. I can only imagine since he first identified her by simply watching the students walk around that she embodied a whole lot of grace as she strode across the campus of Harvard. He approaches her. He finds out her name. Her name is Alice Hathaway Lee. She comes from a very wealthy, prestigious Boston family. He asked her out for a date Alice Lee doesn't know who Theodore Roosevelt is at all, and probably wisely, like most women I would assume, said no. And he kept making his presence known to her, asking her out for dates on dates repeatedly, and she kept saying no, no, no. And this went on for a year. But eventually she consented because Theodore Roosevelt didn't just try to woo her, he wooed her whole family. He went up to her dad. He went into Boston and found her dad, introduced himself, talked to the man. 
They became friends. He found her brothers. He went up to them. He enjoyed hanging out with them. He charmed all the men in her family so that, so that eventually in this very sort of traditional conservative elite Boston wealthy family, she had her dad and her brothers going, this Theodore Roosevelt's an amazing guy. You should date him. So Alice finally starts going out on dates with Theodore Roosevelt soon thereafter, or soon thereafter, soon after their graduation. The two get hitched. And as a wedding present, Theodore Roosevelt has built for Alice this home located on a huge property on Oyster Bay in Long Island, New York, quite a ways east of downtown Manhattan, you have this home that Theodore Roosevelt named Sagamore Hill. Not a bad wedding present for being 23 years old. You can visit Sagamore Hill today. It's a national park site. Now, Alice will spend a lot of time living here, but she'll also spend a lot of time living with Theodore Roosevelt's family in downtown Manhattan and she spends time with them so that she doesn't get lonely because Theodore Roosevelt is gone. Theodore Roosevelt at Harvard had a wide variety of interests. He was interested in science. He was obviously interested in military history. He was interested in business. But in the end, he chose politics. He gets elected the youngest congressman in New York history. While he's in the state legislature in Albany, New York, he quickly earns the reputation of being, no surprise here, a rather obnoxious orator. While the Speaker of the House was trying to conduct business, Theodore Roosevelt would constantly, constantly be standing up, being known for his shrill voice by screaming, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, always wanting to put his two cents into any issue that was being discussed on the floor. So he's up in Albany. His wife is down living with his family in Manhattan. She was pregnant with their first child. While he's up in Albany, he receives a telegram. Your wife is giving birth. Excited, he began celebrating with a few of his friends up in Albany. Although I do not know exactly how Theodore Roosevelt celebrated. He neither drank nor smoked. He did, however, he did, however, drink a pot of coffee every day. No wonder he had so much energy. Anyways, he's jubilant because his wife is giving birth. He's getting, getting ready to you know, pack up and head back down to Manhattan from Albany when another telegram arrives. Come home immediately. Your wife is sick and your mom is sick. So Roosevelt hops on the train, heads back down to Manhattan, goes to his family's home. His wife, Alice, just gave birth to a baby girl. He barely has time to acknowledge this baby girl, who he names Alice after his mom, because his wife is now dying. Meanwhile, he's rushing in between his wife's room and another room in, his ha in the house where his mom is. His mom is dying at the exact same time, and both women end up dying within a few hours of each other. This was a devastating blow for Theodore Roosevelt, as it would be for anybody to lose a spouse and a parent at the exact same time. The grief was extraordinarily great. And on top of all that, it was Valentine's Day. It was February the 14th, 1884. In Theodore Roosevelt's diary for that day, all there is is a big X and a very short sentence, the light has gone out of my life. How does a person recover from such a devastating blow? Well, before I get into that, I want to talk just briefly about the baby girl. Here's Alice Roosevelt. Here's what Alice Roosevelt, the baby girl who will never know her birth mom, here's what she ended up going through. In dealing with his grief, Theodore Roosevelt does not have the energy to be a dad. So he passes baby Alice off to his sister. And he says, here, you raise Alice. I need to get away. So Theodore Roosevelt's sister does raise Alice, and Alice grows up looking at her aunt like a mom. And the two women develop, or the two females, <laughs> one, one woman, one girl, they develop a very close bond, just like that of mother and daughter, 
But then a few years later, Theodore Roosevelt shows up into the picture. And so here comes dad who spent precious little time with Alice and he has with him a new woman. He tells his sister, I want to raise Alice now. And his sister says, please, no, I've, I feel very close to her. Theodore Roosevelt says, no, she's my daughter and takes Alice back to live with him and then says about his new wife, this is your mom. And young Alice doesn't know what to make of this because her biological mom is, is dead. She feels closest to her aunt who's been raising her like she was a, a mom. And now here comes dad to whisk her away from everything that's familiar and say, you're going to live in this house now in Sagamore Hill, and this is your mom. And Theodore Roosevelt forbade young Alice from ever talking about her biological mom. It was as if Alice Sr. never existed. So, okay, imagine you're this young Alice Roosevelt girl. You've been pulled from home to home. You've been told by your dad that we're never going to talk about your biological mom. Mom, you're going to know nothing about her. How would you respond? How would that make you feel? The mom who gave birth to you, who died giving birth to you. You're not allowed to ask your dad, what was she like? How would you behave if you were Alice Roosevelt? Well, if you think to yourself, I'd be really pissed off and I'd be really angry with dad. Well, that's exactly how young Alice Roosevelt was. Alice Roosevelt grew up a rebel, but she's also a Roosevelt, which means she's got a lot of money. So as she became a young woman, she began going out of her way to draw attention to herself, doing, well, maybe not necessarily wild and crazy things, but things like, you know, when the family's on vacation, she'll leave her family, she'll go to parties. She became very outspoken. She became quite a gossip. And she would do other unconventional and unladylike things to draw attention to herself, such as smoking cigarettes. Now, Theodore Roosevelt didn't smoke cigarettes. He was asthmatic. Not that that really would stop somebody from smoking cigarettes in the early 20th century, but he didn't smoke cigarettes. And ladies were not expected to smoke cigarettes. Not a lot of women will start smoking until the 1920s. And even then, it's considered very unladylike. But not Alice. She would smoke cigarettes. And when she became, or rather when Theodore Roosevelt became president of the United States and Alice moves in with the whole family into the White House... She'd walk around puffing on her cigarette, knowing that it would annoy her dad, you know, filling up the whole White House with cigarette smoke. And so one day, Theodore Roosevelt had it out with his daughter and said something to the extent of, you are not allowed to smoke cigarettes under the roof of this noble executive mansion. And <laughs> just like a good rebel girl, she said, she repeated his words back to him and said, oh, I'm not allowed to smoke cigarettes under the roof of this noble executive mansion. Is that what you said, dad? And she says something like this. And Theodore Roosevelt says, yes. And so she would smoke on the roof of the White House. And so here she is, the daughter of the president, smoking cigarettes on the roof of the White House. Well, this, you know, attracted the press and they took pictures of her up there and reported on this. And she'd be up there waving to them all. Stuff like this drove Theodore Roosevelt nuts. So he later, he proclaimed, I can either look after Alice or be president of the United States. I cannot do both. So Alice Roosevelt, she really was one of the very first tabloid celebrities of the 20th century. And she will live a long life. She does not pass away until the year 1980. And she will remain outspoken and controversial her whole life long. Now, going back to that day where she lost her mom in the year 1884, let's once again pick up the story here. How do you cope with such overwhelming grief if you lost both the love of your life and a parent? And now Theodore Roosevelt has lost both of his parents. What do you do? Do you just bury the pain and continue on, head back to work on Monday and just keep on keeping on? How would you process such grief? Well, here's how Theodore Roosevelt processed his grief. And here's where that idea of the strenuous life kicks back in again. As a young boy, Theodore Roosevelt spent a lot of time learning how to take care of himself and comfort himself by going into nature. And Theodore Roosevelt is going to do this again, only he's going to go deep into nature. This is no simple backyard retreat. Roosevelt's going to go into the Dakotas. 
in the 1880s. He's going, in, he's going to go into the land of miners and cowboys. Now, Roosevelt knows he has very little experience with this in his life. Now, he's traveled. He's already traveled quite extensively. He's made it to Africa and Europe as a teenager. So he's traveled. He's seen the world, but he's always seen things through a life of privilege. He's always had money, comfort, and convenience growing up a rich kid. But after the loss of his mom and his wife, he sort of has a to hell with it moment and heads out to the Dakotas to become a rancher. But Theodore Roosevelt is such a bizarre and complex individual. Before he goes out to do this, to live with the miners and the cowboys, to be a tough guy, he has this whole cowboy get-up outfit made for him in Manhattan. He has this really nice hunting knife, and he could just go out and buy a hunting knife, but he has one personally made for him at Tiffany's. And then he's going to have photographs made of himself. Photographs like this one of him being this Badlands cowboy. And understand this picture was not taken out in the Wild West somewhere. This was a staged photograph in Manhattan. It seems like Roosevelt is trying to cultivate this image of himself. Okay, so then he's going to hop on the train. He's going to head out to the Dakota Territory. And he's going to become a rancher. And his ranch is still there today. It's a national park site in, no in North Dakota. So now imagine this picture. You're in a saloon in Deadwood, South Dakota. You've got gamblers, miners, cowboys, thieves, prostitutes, a wide variety of these colorful figures from the Wild West. And into this saloon walks Theodore Roosevelt. He's got on this fancy outfit that was made in New York City. He's wearing glasses. He has a high-pitched, shrill voice. And he loves to fill up the room with that voice. If you're thinking to yourself, Theodore Roosevelt's going to get his butt kicked in this saloon, well, you'd be right, sort of, in terms of the response that Roosevelt generated among these cowboys. They wanted to kick his butt. Theodore Roosevelt doesn't drink. These cowboys want to, want to take shots of whiskey. Theodore Roosevelt literally wants to recite poetry. Theodore Roosevelt does not fit in with this, with this group of, of, of characters from the Wild West. But he then amazes all of them because they didn't understand sort of his inner character. When they would spend hours and days in the saddle, out on the range... Roosevelt didn't complain. He enjoyed it. He talked about how bully it all was. And he particularly impressed the sheriff of South Dakota, sorry, the sheriff of Deadwood, South Dakota, a man by the name of Seth Bullock, who was himself, I mean, he's the sheriff of, of Deadwood. I mean, he is a tough guy through and through. And he spent several days out on the range with Theodore Roosevelt. They were out there driving cattle or doing whatever. And uh, it started raining, and it rained for days on end, to the point that they were soaked through. They're not talking to each other much because they're just trying to survive <laughs> from day to day and you know, what seems to be endless rain. And it got to the point where Seth Bullock thought, he started to get really concerned for Theodore Roosevelt, thinking that he's you know, getting sick, getting depressed. But they were camping out one night, and they're in their tent together, and Theodore Roosevelt turned and looked at Seth Bullock and said to him, that this was the most wonderfully fun thing he'd ever done in his entire life. And Seth Bullock was taken completely aback by, by this. These were conditions that would break most men. They were soaked through. They had very little food. The food that they, they couldn't start a fire to cook because of the rain. It was, it was awful conditions. These were awful conditions. And it was, but it was in these most awful conditions that Theodore Roosevelt was having the most fun. Theodore Roosevelt spent two years out in the Dakota Territory, becoming a cowboy and earning respect among the cowboys. Probably the least likely person who could ever earn the respect of cowboys. I mean, he, he did it. And, and that speaks to his character. He came home to New York City and he began writing books about both his personal experiences and stories of the Wild West. 
Theodore Roosevelt was an incredible writer. He wrote fast. He wrote over he wrote 35 books throughout the course of his whole life. That's a, that's a lot of books, especially given what else he was doing with his life. Now, most historians today read these books uh, with a with a very critical eye because Theodore Roosevelt certainly romanticized the Old West. And Roosevelt's attitude towards the West was not that much different from Custer or um, or Buffalo Bills. He wanted to hunt. Theodore Roosevelt wanted to hunt. He wanted to kill. He enjoyed killing animals. He also saw the progress of civilization being spread throughout the West, and he wanted to be part of that progress. So Theodore Roosevelt had no problem taking land that had once belonged to Native Americans and starting a farm, becoming a rancher, being part of the development of a city and the spread of white culture from east to west. So he was a typical white guy cowboy from that particular perspective. So his stories of the West come from that angle. When he came back to New York City, he was approached by an old friend, Edith. Edith and Theodore were boyfriend-girlfriend back during their high school days. There's not a lot of historical documentation about what their relationship was like in high school. We know that they were together for a particular point of time and that there was a breakup, but there's nothing about what was the cause of the breakup. But when Roosevelt came back home, Edith showed back up into, her, into his life. The great Theodore Roosevelt historian Edmund Morris states that Edith was the best possible wife for Theodore Roosevelt because Edith was quiet and reserved, which balanced out Theodore Roosevelt, and she was extraordinarily smart and tough, just like Theodore Roosevelt. So she is really the better soulmate. The historian Edmund Morris says, Alice Hathaway Lee was pretty. She was attractive, but she didn't have the brains to be a great partner to Theodore Roosevelt. Now, after the death of Alice, Theodore said, I'm never going to marry again, but Edith showed back up into his life, and in this time around, she charmed him. She went after him aggressively in the same way he had done Alice previously. He doesn't want to make a big deal over the fact that he's getting married a second time. So the two of them actually went to London for a private wedding ceremony. And he brings her back to Sagamore Hill, retrieves his daughter Alice from his sister's home. And now, no longer a bachelor rancher, he's back home in New York to recommence his career in politics. He starts off the early 1890s as the police commissioner of New York City. New York City, a city filled with people, one of the biggest cities on the planet. There's no shortage of illegal activities, of gangs, of violence, and Roosevelt makes it his personal mission to clean up this town. So one of the things that was going on in New York City at the time was it was illegal to sell alcohol on Sundays. But owners of bars openly broke that rule and served alcohol on Sundays. And when the cops showed up, well, the owners of the bar simply gave the police officers a bribe and offered them a drink. And the police officers accepted it because they all thought the rule is stupid. Well, not police commissioner Roosevelt. For Roosevelt, the law is the law. It's what protects our freedoms. It's what makes us safe and nobody is above the law. So Roosevelt would spend his Sundays going from bar to bar to bar, shutting them down personally and firing police officers who were caught accepting bribes or in their drinking. In response to all this, the city of Manhattan actually changed the law. They made drinking allowed on Sundays. For Roosevelt, that's great. That's democracy in action. Changing the law is okay, but not enforcing it and accepting bribes, that is not okay. Theodore Roosevelt is not one to shrink away from dangerous situations. And he knows that Manhattan, in particular the Lower East Side of Manhattan, are filled with gangs. And for the most part, the police officers don't venture into territories or to areas, to neighborhoods, where the gangs rule. Similar to the owners of bars and the police officers, there were, bri there were bribes that were being given out to the police officers to turn a blind eye to particular illegal activities. Well, Roosevelt wanted to help end all that as well. But what he needs is somebody in New York City who's familiar with both the 
gangs of the Lower East Side of Manhattan, who is comfortable with the police force in Manhattan, who is familiar with the lives of the poor, and who really understands how the other half lives. While he was police commissioner, Theodore Roosevelt reached out to the famed author and photographer Jacob Rees and asked for Rees to be his personal guide throughout the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Now, sadly, there are no photographs known of Rees and Roosevelt together, but we do have great drawings like this one, where Rees and Roosevelt would walk through some of the most dangerous through some of the most dangerous streets of Manhattan at night, seeing what was going on and making sure police officers were doing their jobs. Supposedly, Theodore Roosevelt uh, wore a cape while he was doing this, like a superhero. And supposedly, he would find uh, some police officers napping on the job, and he'd uh, shake them awake and make sure that they were doing their duty to keep the streets safe. All right, so after he did that job for a couple of years, then... In 1896, when the Republican William McKinley was elected president of the United States of America, and William Jennings Bryan was not, he appealed to William McKinley to get a job helping to run the United States Navy. Now, Theodore Roosevelt was a Republican, William McKinley was a Republican, and William McKinley responded positively, giving Theodore Roosevelt the job as Assistant Secretary of the United States Navy. Now, remember that Theodore Roosevelt, his first book that he published was on the Naval War of 1812. He's fascinated with naval military history. He's also greatly inspired by the book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History by Alfred T. Mahon that had been published just a few years before in 1890. And now Theodore Roosevelt, for the first time, begins feeling that he has real power on the federal level. He wants the United States of America to become the greatest country in the world. In order to do that, he feels like, I've got to help build up our Navy. Now, as assistant secretary to the United States Navy, he doesn't like being assistant anything. He begins encouraging his boss to take long vacations so that he can run the show. And then 1898 happens. And now it's when we review some of the stuff we learned in the previous lecture. All of this should sound very familiar. The United States battleship, the USS Maine, was docked in Havana Harbor in Cuba in February of 1898. This ship mysteriously exploded, killing 258 American soldiers. The cause for the explosion was unknown at the time, but Theodore Roosevelt was one of those politicians in Washington, D.C. at the time, different from William McKinley, who wants war. Theodore Roosevelt said, this country needs a war. Theodore Roosevelt's perspective was, war is what makes us great. Going into battle is the highest aspiration any man could hope to achieve. Theodore Roosevelt was a warmonger. He plays his role in Washington, D.C., or of helping to provoke a war with Spain. So in the previous lecture, we learned a lot about yellow journalism and how the American public because of yellow journalism, they were being whooped up into war frenzy. Now in Washington, D.C. with the federal government, you've got Theodore Roosevelt just making these proclamations that this, the destruction of the U.S.'s Maine was no accident. Spain did it, and we must have war with Spain. You hopefully remember from the previous lecture as well how he sent his message to Admiral Dewey in Hong Kong telling him to get ready to go when war is finally declared, to leave Hong Kong on his flagship, the USS Olympia, and five other American battleships to head into Manila Bay, to catch the Spanish fleet in the Philippines unawares, to capture that fleet and therefore capture Manila and therefore capture the Philippines and make the Philippines an American territory, which Admiral Dewey does. And it was because of this command of Theodore Roosevelt that President McKinley is pretty much handed the Philippines, saying, here you go, look at what we've got now. Now McKinley, in trying to decide what to do with the Philippines, one person that he doesn't have to talk to about it is Theodore Roosevelt, because Theodore Roosevelt left D.C. For me, this makes Theodore Roosevelt a truly exceptional and different type of Washington, D.C. warmonger politician throughout American history. 
when there's been the threat of a potential conflict, there have always been politicians, congresspeople, senators, presidents, who've wanted to have war at a particular time. And they beat the drum and they call for war. But it is very rare in American history where you have a politician that does this, who says, we need to have war. And then once the war is on, they quit their job in D.C. and they go to fight in the war. And then it's, I can't even think of another example where they go to fight on the front lines of the war. So not long after Theodore Roosevelt issued his command to Admiral Dewey, he quit his job as, US, uh, as the assistant to the Secretary of the United States Navy. He quits his job. He, this is no surprise, has his own uniform made, I, I think at Brooks Brothers in Manhattan, and then he puts together a volunteer regiment, the first volunteer cavalry, or it was simply the first cavalry, and it was made up of all volunteers, and began training for the invasion of Cuba. And this is probably the most iconic moment of the entirety of the Spanish-American War. This is the image that Americans are going to have of this war for a long time. So Theodore Roosevelt, using his connections in the United States military, gets a commission to lead a volunteer cavalry into Santiago Bay in Cuba. It's the first cavalry. They're all volunteers. So if you're able to look at your screen and you see the image of Theodore Roosevelt there to the left, you'll notice on the collar of his uniform that he had personally made for himself because he wanted to look good. You see USV, which stands for United States Volunteer. And Roosevelt wants to put together the most diverse all-American cavalry in American history. So he puts the call out to people that he knows. He called upon some of his cowboy friends from the West. He also had Indians, Native Americans in, the, in his volunteer cavalry. He had ex-convicts in his cavalry. He also had Ivy League, Ivy League athletes in his cavalry. From what I understand, he had members of the Harvard tennis team join this cavalry. They were all volunteers. They represented this wide variety of backgrounds uh, 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 in, in American culture. But they were all united by one thing, this idea that they wanted to prove their manhood in battle by following Theodore Roosevelt in a charge against the Spanish. This first volunteer cavalry will forevermore be known by their nickname. They were called the Rough Riders. Here's a few images of uh, Theodore Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. Now, these are real pictures of Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. However, um, I cannot be certain if these pictures were taken before or after the war. Um, after the war was over, we've got the motion picture camera that comes along about the same time in history. And they did, the Rough Riders got together and they did all these reenactments and they rode around and such. And so a lot of the images and pictures of the Rough Riders were actually taken after the war. But here they are. <laughs> Some of these pictures uh, are pretty informal, but all guys who want to be tough guys. Theodore Roosevelt leading the Rough Riders. All right, so off they go in the summer of 1898. Now, Theodore Roosevelt is very excited to lead men into battle. He personally believes that if you are a male, then you should, at some point of time in your life, test yourself by going into battle because battle makes you tough being a soldier brings out the best in you, and that there would be nothing so dishonorable and so despicable as having the opportunity to go to war to fight for your country and not doing so. That is what Theodore Roosevelt genuinely believed, and he genuinely believed that the prestige and greatness of the United States of America rested upon the willingness of American men, of all American men, to fight for their country. Okay, so Theodore Roosevelt is judged both positively and negatively uh, for this particular view, and you can make your own judgment on Theodore Roosevelt uh, in, in terms of this belief and how much you agree with it. One of the things that historians have done is, is try to figure out where does this belief come from? And we can probably trace this in part back to his dad. 
When Theodore Roosevelt wasn't but three years old, the Civil War broke out. Now his dad is from the North and his mom is from the South. And his dad believed in the cause of the Union. His dad, if you remember, was friends with Abraham Lincoln. He wanted to fight. But because mom was from the South, she refused to allow her husband to go and be part of this invasion of the South. So she says, you're not allowed to go. And at this point of time in American history, I mean, specifically during the Civil War, if you were drafted into service in the North, you could get out of the service by paying a replacement $300 to go fight for you. So go figure, if you were a rich person, in the North at least, during the Civil War, you could get out of this war. You'd have to pay somebody $300 to go fight for you. And then that was a way for a poor person who probably is going to get drafted into the war anyways to go to war and collect 300 bucks. There were also scam artists that showed up and said, yeah, I'll fight for you, give me $300, and then disappeared. So this is what Theodore Roosevelt Sr. did, is he paid somebody $300 to go and fight for him, but felt incredible remorse because of that. Because who knows what happened to that guy? Did he die? Theodore Roosevelt Sr. felt like, I, I didn't do my duty for my country. And so Theodore Roosevelt, growing up, I think, internalized this shame of his dad. To be a man means to fight, means to be a soldier. And then Theodore Roosevelt, also being a social Darwinist, he believed that this is the foundation for a strong, good country. To have a country filled with men who are also war veterans. He believed that the experience of battle not only you know, makes your country stronger, more powerful when all the, you've got all these men that are willing to fight, but it makes, these, it makes men as individuals more moral and better person, more moral and better people. So later on, when they're engaging in acts of business or they're in politics or they're doctors or lawyers or whatever, they're simply better people because of this experience of battle. So that was Theodore Roosevelt's attitude towards being a man in military combat. All right, so let's actually talk about the battle that he was involved in, because it is quite a story. All right, so the Rough Riders go down south to Santiago. If you remember the American invasion of Cuba, they quarantined Cuba. They didn't really worry about the capital of Havana in the north. They went down south to Santiago, which was a Spanish military stronghold. And so there are various invasions that take place around Santiago Bay. And Theodore Roosevelt led the Rough Riders into what is remembered as the Battle of San Juan Hill. The battle took place in the early afternoon of the 1st of July, 1898. Now, the Battle of San Juan Hill is very simple to understand. The Rough Riders are literally going to charge up a hill to capture Spanish guns that are perched along a part of the hill known as Kettle Hill. So think of it as a game of King of the Mountain, where the Spanish are on top of the mountain and the Americans are going to charge up and take the top of the mountain from the Spanish. The first part of this charge is going to be through the woods. And the Americans have to make it through the woods first, and then after they make it through the woods, they're going to head up the hill and they're going to try to capture the Spanish guns. Now, the Rough Riders were a cavalry unit, but it's rather sad, especially if you're a horse lover. A lot of the horses died in the transport from Tampa, Florida, down into Cuba. So only a few of the soldiers have horses that they're going to ride on and everybody else is going to be walking, or at least on foot, in this charge. Okay, so here we go. Theodore Roosevelt is on horseback. He leads his men first through the woods. Positioned up in the trees are Spanish sharpshooters, who one by one begin shooting at the Americans. The Americans must identify where the sharpshooters are at and then fire back at them, knocking them out of position. And then, once they make it through the forest, then they're going to charge uphill to capture the Spanish guns. This has the possibility of being a bloodbath. If you're able to look at your screen right now, what you're seeing is the artist rendition, or a, a, an artist rendition of the Battle of San Juan Hill, the charge up San Juan Hill after the Americans leave the woods. And you have Theodore Roosevelt on horseback. And he's calling to his men, forward charge as they go up the hill. Now, if you're a Spaniard at the top of the hill, you're in a fortified position and you've got men charging up a field at you. This should be extraordinarily easy for you. As the men are charging up, aim and shoot, aim and shoot, aim and shoot, aim and shoot, and kill the Americans. 
For the Americans, this is extraordinarily dangerous. You are in an open field marching into straight fire that's coming at you from the top of the hill. And the only way you're going to win this battle is through speed. Here's when you could use the horse. Here's where you could have really used the horses, but you don't have the horses. You got to charge by foot, running up this hill as fast as you possibly can, praying that you don't get shot, making it up to the Spanish guns, shooting, killing, and capturing as many of them as possible, and then you win the battle. Now, the one person who is on a horse is Theodore Roosevelt, which means that as he's leading the men up the hill, he is target number one. It would be so easy to kill Theodore Roosevelt, or for Theodore Roosevelt to have been killed in this battle, but amazingly, he wasn't. And for him, this was the most exciting, invigorating, greatest moment of his entire life. Supposedly during this charge, and this story comes from Edmund Morris's biography on Theodore Roosevelt called The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. Supposedly during this charge, one of the Rough Riders got shot through the lungs fell down into the dirt, dying, coughing up blood, and asphyxiating on his own blood. Theodore Roosevelt saw this, dismounted briefly, grabbed the older soldier that this guy was, and held him up. And the man was petrified because he can't breathe. His esophagus is filling up with blood. The man is literally moments away from drowning in his own blood. He's terrified. He's gasping. His eyes are just agog with fear. And Theodore Roosevelt looks at this man and says to him, isn't it glorious, old man? Isn't it glorious? And then drops him and allows him to die. Gets back on his horse and continues the charge. For Roosevelt, there was nothing more glorious than dying in warfare. And he's not just somebody who said that. He's an individual who actually believed it. He had a lot of friends who tried to convince him not to do this. After all, he was a married man. He had children. And he was walking around before joining the Rough Riders or creating the Rough Riders telling his friends about how he hoped that he got a nice, good, a nice big facial wound in battle that he could brag about for the rest of his life. And his friends would say, Don't you, you've got a family. Why, why would you want to make your wife a widow and for your children to grow up without a dad? But Roosevelt had no time for those type of thoughts or those opinions, which is why for Theodore Roosevelt, this was the greatest moment in his life. He was lucky. He survived it. The Rough Riders made the charge up San Juan Hill. 20% of them died in that charge. By the time they made it to the summit, the Spanish surrendered. The Americans captured the guns, enabling the further capture of Santiago Bay, an American, a quick American victory in this war. Moments after the battle, Theodore Roosevelt and the Rough Riders posed for a, photo for a photograph. This photograph was taken moments after the carnage of the battle and became one of the most iconic images of the entire Spanish-American War and all of the conflicts of 1898. And Theodore Roosevelt is now a national celebrity. Anything he wants to do politically, he's now got the celebrity status to do it. He goes back home, runs to become governor of New York, is elected governor of New York. Now he... Theodore Roosevelt was a Republican, but it's as governor of New York where he begins, where he really begins distinguishing himself as a very different type of Republican. Most Republicans were like William McKinley. They worked very cooperatively with large business interests, with corporate interest. And one can argue fairly easily that the Republican Party was really in the hands of the wealthy industrialists like Carnegie and Rockefeller and such. But Roosevelt was not. Roosevelt was a bit of a maverick Republican. In fact, one of his relatives said, I don't understand why the American people don't understand that Theodore Roosevelt is a Democrat at heart. Theodore Roosevelt believed strongly in the regulation of businesses. He believed, as he said in his own words, that the rich man should be held to the same accountability as the poor man and he became an advocate for workers' rights. Now, being a Republican who believed that the role of government was to help regulate businesses to protect the general welfare of all, and in particular, the livelihood of workers, this made him immensely popular, at least among the people of the state of New York. 
And because he's a war hero and a national celebrity, he's garnering attention from the whole nation. So already Theodore Roosevelt seems like he's on the fast track to become the next president of the United States of America. And he draws the negative attention of the leadership of the Republican Party. The leaders of his own party do not like Theodore Roosevelt. They see the future of the Republican Party as continuing to work cooperatively with big corporate interests. So in other words, do not regulate businesses, do not fight for unions or for better working conditions for the workers, allow these big corporations to continue to make money and they'll protect the Republican Party. And so the Republican Party has this very positive symbiotic relationship with these corporations. And Theodore Roosevelt doesn't seem like he wants the Republican Party to go in that direction. He believes that the role of government is to regulate corporate interests. Okay, so I've said that over several times now. Hopefully the point is made. But So the Republican establishment is trying to decide what the heck do we do with Theodore Roosevelt. He's the most popular politician in America right now. He's a war hero. How do we control him? And they find a way. They believe they can control Theodore Roosevelt. They find the perfect position in the United States federal government for him. Now think to yourself of the politicians that you know in Washington, D.C. Who has the most fame with the least amount of actual power? Who's a person in D.C. that you know this individual's name, you know this individual's title, this person's on the news from time to time, but according to the Constitution, this person really doesn't have much clout at all. Can you think of who this person might be? The Republican Party told Theodore Roosevelt that in the year 1900, he was to be the running mate for William McKinley. So that when William McKinley won the presidency of 1900, Theodore Roosevelt would be vice president of the United States of America. The vice presidency of the United States is, or at least can be, a completely useless job. The Constitution only grants you one power as vice president of the United States, and that is it makes you the president of the Senate. And if ever the Senate has a tied vote, since there's an even number of senators, you get to break the vote. That's it. Other than that, you only have a job if the president wants you to do a job. So if the, so if the president has to meet the prime minister of Canada but doesn't have time to do it, then the president might tell you, the vice president, to go and talk to the prime minister of Canada or something like that. But you're effectively neutered in terms of your power. And Theodore Roosevelt knows this, and the Republican establishment knows it. But one of the leaders of the Republican Party is a little bit nervous about this situation, because the one thing that could catapult Roosevelt from a position of no power to a position of a whole lot of power is if something bad should actually happen to President McKinley. If President McKinley dies in office, Theodore Roosevelt automatically becomes president of the United States. But the thing is, nobody expects for that to happen. Because really, practically, how often does a president die? McKinley and Roosevelt were elected in November of 1900. In 1901, they took the oath of office. And not but a half a year later, William McKinley was attending a fair in Buffalo, New York. And at this fair, he was greeting people. If you wanted to meet the President of the United States of America, you could stand in line to meet him. You could say hi and shake his hand. There was a long line of people. It seemed to be a very nice affair. Everybody really in awe of meeting the President of the United States of America and having the opportunity to shake his hand. But in this line of people was an individual named Leon Sholgosh. Leon Sholgosh was a former factory worker who was laid off from working in a Carnegie Steel Mill when J.P. Morgan purchased Carnegie Steel Mills. And Leon Sholgosh, bitter and angry at the super wealthy, blamed those wealthy industrialists and the politicians like William McKinley that openly supported them for the state of poverty in which he and so many other Americans lived. 
and Leon Sholgosh became an anarchist. Anarchism was a movement that was popular in the late 19th century that believes that the best form of government is no government, that there should be no government, no law enforcement, no laws, no nothing, just people completely free. In the late 19th century, throughout Europe and the United States of America, anarchism became a very popular movement because there were so many desperate people. The anarchists believe that the way forward historically is just to kill people with power, politicians and wealthy industrialists alike. If they are individuals, men with money and power, be they in politics or business, just kill them, kill them all. And that killing will terrorize the rest of them to maybe start being nice and kinder to the poor people by providing them with the homes and food and health care they need to survive. And then, and this is just, this comes from the minds of people who are completely desperate. Once you kill all the people with power, then we can create a new society from the rubble of the old. Leon Sholgosh was living in poverty. He was desperate and he was angry. And he's in line to meet William McKinley in September of 1901. He took a gun. He put the gun in his right hand. And he covered that gun up like it was, uh, like his hand was bandaged. So when he got up to greet the President of the United States, the President of the United States was right-handed, extended his right hand to shake Leon Sholgosh's hand, noticing that his hand was covered in a bandage, apologized, and then extended his, extended his left hand to do an alternative handshake. Leon Sholgosh then thrust the pistol up to the belly of William McKinley, fired, William McKinley collapses with a horrible abdominal wound. This is one of the worst, most painful ways to die. And it took him a while to die. Like some people who are dying, he got a surge of energy and good health at the very end. And the doctors grew optimistic that, hey, he's going to live, he's going to survive. But in the end, William McKinley died. And the leadership of the Republican Party, well, their worst nightmare came true. So... I was starting to say this earlier. There was one leader of the Republican Party who was really concerned about Theodore Roosevelt being vice president, and he famously proclaimed, don't you understand? That damned cowboy is one heartbeat away from the presidency. And of course, that worst nightmare came true. And in 1901, that damned cowboy, Theodore Roosevelt, became the president of the United States of America. Now, when McKinley was shot and the doctors are trying to save him, Theodore Roosevelt actually wasn't around. Where was Theodore Roosevelt when all of this was happening? Well, in typical Roosevelt style, he was mountain climbing in the Adirondacks of New York. And obviously this is a day and age before the telecommunication systems that we have now. Roosevelt isn't out hiking with a cell phone and nobody really knows where he is. And a boy was actually hired to find Theodore Roosevelt in the mountains and he did. And he handed Theodore Roosevelt a note, which explained to Theodore Roosevelt what was going on. And Roosevelt made haste back to Washington, D.C. When McKinley died, Roosevelt was sad for the loss of life. He was angry at the anarchist movement and what anarchists threatened in the United States of America. But everybody could tell. He was jubilant to be the president of the United States of America. Theodore Roosevelt later on said, nobody had more fun being president of the United States than me. Being president of the United States of America has to be one of the most stressful jobs in the world. And you can see this in the photographs of the president. You look at a picture of an individual who becomes president on, the, on their inauguration, what they look like. And then eight years later, the, the picture there, and you see the gray hair, the worn lines on their face. It is a difficult, stressful endless, thankless job. But it was just Roosevelt's temperament. He loved that type of stress. For him, the strenuous life was fun. In September of 1901, Theodore Roosevelt becomes the 26th president of the United States. And at that dawn of the 20th century, Theodore Roosevelt sets the United States of America on the course to becoming a world power. One of the very first things Theodore Roosevelt did as president of the United States was he became the very first president to invite an African-American to dine with him 
at the White House. That African-American was Booker T. Washington, head of the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Now, you would think that this first symbolic act as president of the United States would cast Theodore Roosevelt among the most progressive civil rights presidents in American history, but that would not be true. First of all, this was Booker T. Washington, who he invited to the White House, a man who had supported a segregated Jim Crow South. It might have been different if Theodore Roosevelt had, had invited W.E.B. Du Bois to come in to eat with him at the White House. But still, you can say, hey, he's still the first president to invite an African-American to dine with him at the White House. It's a big deal. But Theodore Roosevelt's political advisors encouraged him never to do this again, as it would be politically disastrous. Now, Theodore Roosevelt, always kind of a maverick, did listen to this advice. And this was the only time that he dined in the White House with Booker T. Washington or any African-American, period. And then when it came to his civil rights legacy, Theodore Roosevelt made a decision five years after this famous dinner with Booker T. Washington that clearly marked him as not supporting African-American civil rights. And it was a decision that involved an incident that happened in Brownsville, Texas. So in Brownsville, Texas, there was an incident where a white bartender was killed and a white police officer was shot. And the people of the town, they accused the African-American soldiers who were stationed at nearby Fort Brown for the killing and the wounding. They said the black soldiers did it. And there was absolutely no evidence that the soldiers who were in the barracks all night had anything to do with this incident. But Theodore Roosevelt, in order to provide peace in the community of Brownsville, Texas, simply dishonorably discharged all of the African-American soldiers who were stationed in Fort Brown that night. So Theodore Roosevelt's overall civil rights legacy, not good. Now, Theodore, legacy, Theodore Roosevelt's legacy as President of the United States lies in his actions of increasing the power of the executive branch significantly. Theodore Roosevelt made the presidency very strong and very powerful. And here's a really easy way to think of it. In the late 19th century, most Americans cannot identify a significant president from that point of time in history. So Americans, most Americans know that, you know, know about Abraham Lincoln. They've certainly heard of Abraham Lincoln, who was assassinated in 1865. But then from 1865 to Theodore Roosevelt, 1901, who were the presidents? Now, Hopefully, from listening to some of my lectures, you can identify a few of them. You know, Andrew Johnson, Grover Cleveland, William McKinley. But for the most part, oh, yeah, there's Ulysses S. Grant. He was important, too. But, you know, for the most part, overwhelmingly, the presidents at this point in time in history, throughout that 50 years, the whole second half of the, of the, of the late 19th century, or, or I guess closer to 35 years, rather, at the, at, after the Civil War through 1901, you know, the presidents are largely insignificant. The executive branch is fairly weak. Not that they don't make, not that the presidents don't make very important decisions in the governance of the United States of America and diplomacy and such, but, but in terms of significant presidents being iconic, inspirational leaders for the American people, there's really nobody between Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt. Now, Theodore Roosevelt was a celebrity before becoming president of the United States of America, but so was Ulysses S. Grant. But Theodore Roosevelt is going to use his charisma and his clout and just his brazenness to increase the power of the executive branch. And specifically, he thinks of himself as a progressive president, that the job of government is to regulate big business to promote the welfare for all Americans. He does not want the United States of America to be ruled by a handful of renegade capitalists who have the money to do nearly anything. He believes that the job of government is to protect the common welfare of all Americans, that that is going to be 20th century democracy. As he says, and I've said this quote once before, and I'm going to say it again, as Theodore Roosevelt said, the rich man should be held to the same accountability as the poor man. Okay, so how does he do this? Well, Theodore Roosevelt is remembered as being a trust buster, a trust buster. 
What's that mean? It means he uses the power of the federal government to sue companies. So the United States of America is literally going to sue companies for becoming monopolies and violating the Sherman Antitrust Act and to enforce workers' rights and regulatory legislation that's already in effect. So in other words, Theodore Roosevelt uses the power of the presidency to do what the Constitution empowers him to do, enforce the laws. So he goes after businesses. If you're not playing by the rules, the United States of America, the government of the United States is coming after you. The federal government is coming after you. This hadn't happened before because most politicians were in the hands of the wealthy. They were being paid off. Roosevelt's not like that. He's doing his own, his own thing, which is why he tends to grow in popularity as the American president while, while doing this. Now, not every American admired him for doing this. Uh, some of those wealthy capitalists didn't like Theodore Roosevelt. J.P. Morgan considered Theodore Roosevelt to be his personal nemesis. A fantastic example of how Theodore Roosevelt expanded the power of the executive branch related to the coal strike of 1902. The United States of America was dependent upon coal in the early 20th century. Coal was needed for heat in homes. Coal was needed to run the many locomotives around the United States of America. We, are de we, are, we were a country dependent upon coal. Now, in order to get the coal, we depend upon coal miners to go deep into the coal mines to dredge out this coal. And this is very dangerous work. It's also very unhealthy work. As a coal miner, you go down there, you're breathing in this coal dust, likely you're gonna develop black lung, you're gonna be sick, you're gonna die at a young age. There are the rare but tragic situations when coal mines collapse and you're essentially buried alive in a coal mine and you do this horrible work and you get paid very, very, very little. And just like most all Americans at this point in time in history, you're at the whim of your, of your of, or rather you work by the grace of your manager. At any point in time, you could get laid off. If there's a buyout or downsizing of some sort, you may lose your job. In other words, life is rough as a coal miner. It's difficult, dangerous, unhealthy work, and you get paid very little. And yet the country is dependent upon your work. Don't you deserve more? So in the spring of 1902, the coal miners went on strike. You want us to bring out coal? Pay us more. Now, we've talked about strikes before. The Homestead strike, the Pullman strike. You know how these things go down. Management's going to say no. Management's going to try to bring in scabs and, and fire the people who are going on strike. But what happens with the coal strike of 1902, there were threats of violence. The National Guard got involved to, to, to stop the violence. There were a wide variety of negotiations that were happening, but essentially the strike just deadlocked. Every, everything just got deadlocked. And this continues on for months. Meanwhile, there's a limited amount of coal in the United States of America, and the price of coal is going up significantly so that most Americans who are dependent upon coal to heat their homes will not be able to afford to heat their homes as 1902 starts to approach 1903 and winter's coming. So what happened was Theodore Roosevelt did something that no president had done before in American history. He brought to the White House both the union leaders who were leading the strike and the owners of the coal mine and, and, the, and the companies and other wealthy industrialists who had a vested interest in the coal industry. And one of the most important people uh, on that side would have been J.P. Morgan. And he brought both of them together. He listened to the demands of both sides. And then he single-handedly arbitrated the agreement. Here's what the coal miners are going to get. Here's what the owners are going to get. Now that's that, everybody back to work. So Theodore Roosevelt was the first president in American history to use the power of the presidency to end a strike and to negotiate a settlement between essentially management and labor. And he felt empowered to do this because of the impending national disaster that would have happened had the coal strike gone into the winter of 1902-1903. He said, this is a national emergency, I have the power to intervene. And he did. So this is what Theodore Roosevelt is known for, and he's creating the new presidency of the 20th century, a powerful presidency. And there's a term that's associated with this. 
his trust busting, his negotiating an end to a strike. He said that he was going to use the power of the presidency as a bully pulpit. Yeah, there's that word bully again. When you hear the president using his powers as a bully pulpit, this means that the president is going to advocate on behalf of a particular issue. So in other words, the president is not just going to respond and be a representative of the people, but rather is going to speak out for the people. Let me tell you, here's what we're going to do. And that could be towards uh, the people as a whole, like culturally in the United States of America, here's the direction we should go. Or it could be to business and industry, or even to use the power of the presidency to enforce particular laws to drive the country in a particular direction. In a particular direction. So that term bully pulpit was first used in the Theodore Roosevelt administration. Now, when it came to foreign policy, Theodore Roosevelt also had a particular phrase that was used to describe our foreign policy. Now, Theodore Roosevelt truly believed in American imperialism. He wanted the United States of America to be just as strong and as great as any European power was in the late 19th century countries like France, Germany, Britain. And this particular phrase represents the philosophy for how America can grow to be this powerful, respected country. He said in regards to American foreign power, uh, policy that we should, quote, speak softly and carry a big stick. Speak softly and carry a big stick. Now, what is meant by this? Well, first, by speaking softly. By speaking softly, he means that the United States of America should not be aggressive in its language or in its diplomacy. We shouldn't threaten other countries, at least not in our communication, and certainly not in the president's rhetoric. But we should, quote, carry a big stick. And the big stick is, of course, our military. We should develop a very powerful military. That way, the rest of the world will look upon the United States of America as a quiet, peaceful giant, and we'll let our powerful military essentially do our talking for us. So in our diplomatic interactions with other countries, we should be very respectful. We should avoid any hostile overtures, but we should have an extraordinarily powerful military, which would suggest to them we don't want to mess with the United States of America. Okay, and the best example of speaking softly and carrying a big stick was something called the Great White Fleet. Now, we know that Theodore Roosevelt loves battleships and he loves naval military history. And in the early 20th century, the United States of America built 16 brand new, cutting-edge technology, steam-powered battleships. And from 1907 to 1909, Theodore Roosevelt had these ships, first of all, painted white, because white is the color of peace, and that's why it's called the Great White Fleet. And these 16 battleships sailed all over the world. So they literally did a tour all over the world. They went to Japan, Australia, India, around to Europe, intentionally docking in a peaceful goodwill mission in the major harbors of the world's major superpowers. This was speaking softly and carrying a big stick. Theodore Roosevelt was saying, without actually having to say it, here we are. We're the United States of America. We're really nice. We're your friend. We want to be your trading partner. But if you mess with us, we've got the guns to blow you up. That's speaking softly and carrying a big stick. Here is another image of the Great White Fleet. And there were times where Theodore Roosevelt flexed the muscles of the United States military to achieve his goal of acquiring, acquiring greater power for the United States of America. And one of the best examples of that was the American support of the Panamanian Revolution. So I hope you're familiar with the country of Panama. The country of Panama sits on the Panamanian Isthmus that connects South America with North America. And at the dawn of the 20th century, Panama was not its own country, but it was part of the larger neighboring country of Colombia. Now, the United States of America was interested in Panama because we wanted to build a canal through Panama. There had long been an interest in cutting a canal somewhere through Central America to cut the time between traveling between the Atlantic and the Pacific and making that trip much 
easier. It is very difficult to go around Cape Horn. There had been previous attempts to build a canal through the country of Nicaragua. And if you look at it on a map, you think, well, that doesn't make much sense because Nicaragua is so much more wide than the country of Panama. But Nicaragua is filled with lakes and they thought they could create a series of canals that could cut through Nicaragua fairly easily. But too many men died of malaria and yellow fever and other tropical diseases trying to build this canal. It ended up being too expensive and those projects were abandoned. So what the United States government did under the Roosevelt administration was encourage the people who lived on the Panamanian Isthmus to have a rebellion against the against Colombia. I mean, they were all Colombian citizens at the time. And they did this and they rose up in rebellion. But before the government in Bogota, the capital of Colombia, really had a chance to respond, a United States battleship, the USS Nashville, showed up in support of the Panamanian rebels. Panama goes free, they form their own country, and the government grants to the United States of America a 20-mile wide swath of land through which the United States can build the Panama Canal, which is considered to be one of the greatest engineering feats of all time. This was an amazing thing that Theodore Roosevelt was so very proud of, because remember, he's a Navy guy, loves his battleships, right? So now we can get our battleships in between the Atlantic and the, and the Pacific in half the time. And then it, this just speaks to the grandeur of the United States of America, our political ability, our engineering ability, the manpower, the steel and cement, the ingenuity that went into creating this huge structure. It really was a testimony to the power and the ability of our nation, the Panama Canal. Now understand that Theodore Roosevelt did this all with the power of the presidency. I mean, talk about a bully pulpit. But when it came to the Panama Canal, Congress was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You need our approval constitutionally to do this. But as Theodore Roosevelt joked, while Congress goes on arguing, so does the construction of the canal. This wasn't the only big, bold move that Theodore Roosevelt made in the Caribbean region during his presidency. Not only had we made this big, bold move toward Colombia, Theodore Roosevelt also made a big, bold move in regards to things going on in the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic, which at that point in time in history was known as Santo Domingo, it was a free country, but it was indebted to Spain, and Spain actually tried to take back the Dominican Republic, or Santo Domingo. So Spain said, you know, you guys owe us so much money that we're essentially going to collect our debt by taking you over. We're going to make you part of the Spanish Empire again. Seems like Spain, Spain, this for me, it seems like this is something Spain was doing in response to losing the, the Spanish-American War a few years before and trying to get back some of its old Caribbean colonies. Anyway, the United States of America just simply said, no, you're not allowed to do this. In the 1820s, President Monroe had issued the Monroe Doctrine stating that European imperialism, European colonization of the Americas that began with Christopher Columbus in 1492 is now over, that Europeans are no longer allowed to involve themselves in acquiring new lands in either North or South America, because this creates political instability in North and South America, which eventually affects the United States of America. So Roosevelt added to the Monroe Doctrine, saying the United States of America has the right and the power to enforce the Monroe Doctrine, and we have the right to intervene in North and South America to provide economic and military stability, which means that our military, the United States military, will be a presence in North and South America to provide stability in particular countries. You know, not just to keep out the Europeans, we'll do that, but we're going to provide stability within particular countries. In other words, we're going to support regimes and governments as we see fit. So in other words, the United States of America is becoming the big brother of essentially the rest of the Western world, or rather the Western Hemisphere, North and South America. Not all countries will be appreciative of this. The country of Colombia, for example, doesn't see the United States of America as being necessarily supportive of their interests. 
Theodore Roosevelt is certainly looking well beyond the borders of the United States of America, attempting to identify where American interests lie in international conflicts. One of these conflicts being a war that took place beginning in 1904 between the country of Japan and the country of Russia. Throughout the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, Russia is clearly on the decline in terms of being a world power. Japan, on the other hand, is rising up in its industrial and military might. The history of Japan in the 19th century is the story of international humiliation and then vindication. The 19th century had seen European countries dominate the rest of the world and even take over large swaths of land and throughout the rest of the world. Britain, Germany, France, even Italy, even the Netherlands. They had taken over large areas in Asia and Africa. And Japan had seen this happen. And Japan did not want to become one of these colonized areas. So they decided to defend their island country by adapting the ways of Europeans. And it was actually our country, the United States of America, that opened up trade with Japan in the 1850s before, uh, before our Civil War and encouraged the modernization and the industrial development of Japan. And Japan did this. And within a period of time of like 50 years, Japan made this incredible leap out of the Middle Ages and into the modern era to become a modern, industrialized, powerful country. But Japan is also a very, very mountainous country with limited resources. I mean, if you're going to be a powerful, modern country, you're going to need steel and oil and coal. And Japan is relatively small, so they can either rely upon trade to acquire these things, or Japan can do what pretty much every Western European power is doing at this time, create an empire. And Japan decides to make itself an empire. And in the early 20th century, it invades northern Korea, and then it goes into a region called Manchuria, and it takes over some Russian possessions. The government in, in, of Russia at the time, which is in St. Petersburg, they declare war on Japan. They take their navy, which is stationed in the Baltic Sea in St. Peter, in, in Petersburg. It takes them a half a year to send the navy all the way out of Europe, around Africa, down through the Indian Ocean, around East Asia, back up to Japan. And when the Russian Navy finally shows up in Japanese seas to fight the Japanese Navy, the Japanese Navy sinks those Russian ships and the battle lasts a few minutes. It's all over. And Japan becomes the first Asian country to decisively beat a European country in warfare in the modern age. And Japan continues its expansion. Now, this is all happening in East Asia and Eastern Europe. What's any of this have to do with the United States of America? And most Americans don't really care what's happening between Russia and Japan. But Theodore Roosevelt does. Japan is clearly the superior military power. But Russia has ancient claims on the lands that Japan is taking. So Theodore Roosevelt summons ambassadors from Japan and ambassadors from Russia to the city of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Why Portsmouth, New Hampshire? I have no clue. To negotiate a peace treaty between their two countries. And he is successful in this endeavor. Theodore Roosevelt, a warmonger himself, negotiates a peace treaty between Russia and Japan. And doing this, well, it's a peace treaty. It ends a war. It halts future conflicts. Neither side was 100% happy with the result. But once again, President Roosevelt arbitrates peace. Now, Roosevelt emerged out of this negotiation with a few perspectives. Uh, first of all, he said the perspective of the Russians. These are people who are stuck in the past. They've got their pride and that's it. In Japan, Roosevelt identified Japan in the early 20th century as being on the trajectory to become the dominant power of the Pacific Ocean, even though that had been set in motion in part because of the United States of America. We had encouraged Japan to open up and to trade with us and to become a modern, industrialized, developed country. But now that Japan had done that, Japan also wants power and prestige. 
They also want to be an empire. And so Theodore Roosevelt predicted that the day would come where American interest in the Pacific and Japanese interest in the Pacific would clash and war would break out between our two countries. In short, Theodore Roosevelt predicted war between the United States, predicted World War II nearly 35 years before World War II happened. For his efforts in bringing together Russia and Japan to negotiate a peace, Theodore Roosevelt was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Much later on in history, in the year 2001, Theodore Roosevelt, who'd long since been dead, was posthumously awarded by President Bill Clinton the Medal of Honor for his heroism at San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War. Theodore Roosevelt, the only president to receive both the Medal of Honor and the Nobel Peace Prize. Two honors that don't necessarily go hand in hand, but certainly reflect the complexity of Theodore Roosevelt. And speaking of the complexity of Theodore Roosevelt, here's a completely different story. These are pelicans. These pelicans live in large numbers in Florida. In particular, these pelicans live in large numbers on an island on the Atlantic coast of Florida, a little bit north of Miami. That island is known as Pelican Island. But in the early 20th century, these pelicans were hunted to near extinction. Why were they hunted to near extinction? For this. Very fashionable, very gaudy, very expensive hats that were worn by women in the early 20th century. Why is anything ever hunted to extinction? Money. There's money to be made. And hat-making millinaries would take these pelican feathers, sew them into these elaborate hats, and these became all the fashion craze for ladies in the early 20th century. And people were willing to pay top dollar for these nice hats. So Theodore Roosevelt was informed about this, and Theodore Roosevelt was personally disgusted by it. Now understand, Theodore Roosevelt himself loves hunting. He's not averse to shooting animals. But for him, there was something perverse about hunting an animal to extinction to simply make a few bucks on a fancy hat. And he felt compelled to do something about this. So he drew his cabinet in around him and he wanted to have a conversation about this. And he asked them what he thought, or rather what they thought he could do about it. And specifically, as the conversation developed, was there anything in the Constitution to stop the President of the United States of America from claiming land within the United States of America and using the power of the executive branch to protect that land? And so there was some legal constitutional talk that happened, and they eventually decided, no, go for it. And so Theodore Roosevelt supposedly said something like, and so be it. And he claims Pelican Island as being federal property with no hunting allowed. Congress responds to this favorably by passing something called the Antiquities Act of 1906, which allows the federal government to purchase and preserve areas of historic, scientific, or cultural significance. So in other words, if there's something out there that the federal government, specifically the President of the United States, identifies as being important for, as it says here, either historic or scientific or cultural reasons, then the government can buy it and preserve it. And thus begin, began the environmental activism of President Theodore Roosevelt. When Roosevelt was president, he traveled all over the United States of America, specifically wanted, wanting to visit those beautiful natural areas that are icons of our nation. I remember Theodore Roosevelt it was, that little, was once that little boy who found solace in nature, found comfort in nature, and he will become a president who will become significant in his dedication to preserving nature. One of the places that he wants to go to is here. He wants to see these mountains. He wants to go into and hike these mountains. These are the Sierra Mountains in California. And when he visits these mountains for the first time as president of the United States of America, there is one man who lives in these mountains that he wants to meet. 
John Muir. And here are these two famous men pictured together. This is, for me, one of my favorite pictures from all American history. This is a detail of this picture. If you look at the bottom left-hand corner of this picture, you see Yosemite Falls. This is obviously John Muir and Theodore Roosevelt together in Yosemite Valley. Roosevelt wanted to do more than just meet John Muir. He wanted to do more than just shake his hand for a second. He knew who John Muir was. He knew John Muir's story. He had read John Muir's books. And so when they got together, the President of the United States of America eluded his personal security guards, grabbed John Muir, and the two men went off into the woods for a couple of days. And Theodore Roosevelt had a personal guide of John Muir leading him on a two-man hike through Yosemite Valley. For Muir, this was the luckiest day of his life. This, was, this had to have been the luckiest moment in his life, at least politically, because John Muir has the captive audience for multiple days of the President of the United States, and Muir encourages Theodore Roosevelt to preserve, to preserve, to preserve as much American wild land as possible. Save it. You have the power to save it. You have the power to create national parks. You have the power to preserve species of animals, plants, trees. Preserve, preserve, preserve. And it inspires Theodore Roosevelt, who, during his presidency, will preserve more land than any other president. How much land does Theodore Roosevelt preserve? 148 million acres. Theodore Roosevelt is clearly a president who appreciated the importance of wild lands in the United States of America. He understood John Muir's phrase that nothing tolerable is safe. He had a keen sense that American corporate interests would eventually cut down all the trees, build hotels and restaurants and otherwise beautiful areas in the United States. And he had a keen sense that these things need to be preserved for our own benefit and for the benefit of future generations. Here's a fantastic picture of John Muir and Theodore Roosevelt and their entourage standing at the base of a gigantic redwood tree in the mountains of California. So for what it's worth, Muir and Roosevelt, it obviously was a great meeting and a very productive hike, but they were a little bit competitive with each other. Roosevelt would challenge Muir to, to identify birds by their bird songs. And there was one bird song that, uh, that Muir heard. That, you know, Theodore Roosevelt asked, hey, what's, what bird is that? And Muir's like, I don't, I don't know. He, he couldn't identify it. And Roosevelt identified the bird. I personally don't know what bird this was. And, and Roosevelt made fun of him. He said, how could you be America's greatest naturalist and not know that particular bird? And Muir, I guess, sort of had to, you know swallow his pride a little bit with that. <laughs> and then later on, when they were camping out, John Muir, the ultimate nature lover, looked at Theodore Roosevelt and said, Mr. President, when will you ever get over your childish urge, your childish desire to want to kill things? Trying to make the president feel ashamed that he was a hunter and that hunting was an infantile hobby. So during this hiking trip, they both poked at each other a little bit. But still, certainly one of the greatest meetings in American history. Theodore Roosevelt traveled all over the United States of America, setting aside an incredible amount of land. This is land that, would become, that became public land. It became land that could be used by any American. It belongs to everybody. And he says so when he visits here. This is the north gate of, Ye of Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone is mostly in Wyoming, but I believe that this particular North Gate entrance is in Montana. And they were constructing this particular gate, and Theodore Roosevelt gave this speech. And these speeches were pretty improvisational, too, and they're incredibly eloquent soliloquies on why we should preserve nature. And when they finished building the North Gate into Yellowstone, they emblazoned on it a quote from the speech that Theodore Roosevelt gave. So when you enter Yellowstone from the north, if you ever enter Yellowstone from the north, it's pretty remote. You are greeted by a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. It says, for the benefit and the enjoyment of the people. Another place where Theodore Roosevelt visited was the Grand Canyon. Now, at the time, there were commercial interests uh, that were looking at the Grand Canyon, specifically 
a railroad company wanted to build a railroad line into the Grand Canyon and build hotels and restaurants along the edge of the Grand Canyon. And Roosevelt felt that this would be a complete desecration of the Grand Canyon, so he preserves the land of the Grand Canyon, visits the Grand Canyon, and gives this speech. And in this speech, he says, oh, so eloquently, why it is important to preserve natural lands. You know, this is just a tough argument to make. When there's a lot of money to be gained in commercial development, you know, why should we protect something just because it's pretty? And really very few people other than John Muir have been able to articulate so eloquently, so poignantly as Theodore Roosevelt, here's why we need our national parks. So here's what Theodore Roosevelt says. In the Grand Canyon, Arizona has a natural wonder, which, so far as I know, is in kind absolutely unparalleled throughout the rest of the world. I want to ask you to do one thing in connection with it, in your own interest and in the interest of the country, to keep this great wonder of nature as it now is. I was delighted to learn of the wisdom of the Santa Fe Railroad people in deciding not to build their hotel on the brink of the canyon. I hope you will not have a building of any kind, not a summer cottage, a hotel, or anything else, to mar the wonderful grandeur, the sublimity, the great loneliness and beauty of the canyon. Leave it as it is. You cannot improve on it. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. What you can do is to keep it for your children your children's children, and for all who come after you as one of the great sights which every American, if he can travel at all, should see. For me, what a beautiful and eloquent thing to say about the natural world. Leave it as it is. You cannot improve on it. Theodore Roosevelt was president of the United States from 1901 until 1909. You remember that he became president first when President McKinley was assassinated, and Theodore Roosevelt proclaimed that that first term that was three and a half years long was going to be his first term, even though it was McKinley, not him, who had been elected president. He would later regret that statement, wishing in the year 1908 that he could run for president once again. Now, those seven and a half years that he spent as president of the United States were memorable years for the American presidency. He was one of the few presidents to bring to the White House a huge family. Here's a picture of him and Edith and their six children. And many of his children were, for the most part, just as wild and crazy as Theodore Roosevelt himself was. And Theodore Roosevelt could also be understood as a boy who never really grew up. He was always playing with his kids. And this sometimes astounded visitors to the White House and occasionally to Sagamore Hill. One time an ambassador showed up to visit Theodore Roosevelt when he was at Sagamore Hill. And as the car pulled up to the house at Sagamore Hill, the ambassador was astounded by what he saw. He saw Theodore Roosevelt leaning out of the second story window, holding on to one of his children who was completely <laughs> suspended outside of the window and that child was holding on to another child and they were essentially creating a human ladder from the ground up to that second story window and the ambassador started questioning what was going on and why the president of the united states would be acting in such a way to which one of the president's aides who was there turned and looked at the guest and said one must always remember that the president of the united states is about six years old Another visitor who wanted to meet the president who came to the White House this time was talking to the president's secretary, trying to work out a time by which he could talk to the president. And the secretary was saying, you know, the president's schedule is booked. He has no time to talk to you unless you would like to talk to, to the president during one of his line walks. And so the guest heard a walk and was like, oh, the president's taking a walk. Yeah, that'd be a perfect time. I could, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to the president during a walk. But the president's walks were these line walks that were... <laughs> that were they, these were not just a nice little stroll around the White, Hole, White House grounds. Line walks were something that Theodore Roosevelt did with his children. Usually they were done with his children, but in this case he did it by himself. And what he did was he literally 
took out a map, put his one finger down where he was starting, in this case would be the White House, and then he would close his eyes and put his finger down, his other finger down, in another part of the map, just kind of see where it landed, and then he would walk in a straight line from point A to point B. And the rule was, as you walk in a straight line from point A to point B and you come across an obstacle, you are allowed to go over the obstacle, through the obstacle, or under the obstacle, but you're not allowed to go around the obstacle. So this poor visitor who simply wanted to chat with Theodore Roosevelt about whatever ended up finding himself on a walk in which he had to climb over fences and walk through buildings and, to his astonishment, swim across the Potomac River. Also, while at the White House, Theodore Roosevelt hired as one of his aides a former United States Army officer who was also an accomplished boxer. And when Roosevelt needed to blow off a little steam from the stress of the job, he would tell his aide, and this guy's name was Dan Moore, he would tell his, this aide, Dan Moore, hey, all right, you got to box me now. You got to box me now. You know, this is part of the job. You have to fight me. You have to fight me. And so they would spar together and they would they, they'd get pretty intense. And at one point in time, Moore punched Theodore Roosevelt so hard that Theodore Roosevelt lost much of his eyesight in one eye. And, 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 and as a testament to Theodore Roosevelt's character, he didn't say anything. He didn't tell Moore that he had gone blind in an eye because of one of these boxing incidents, one of these, one of these times that they were boxing together. So it was only until later, much later, that this man was reading one of Roosevelt's memoirs where Roosevelt confessed that he had gone blind, and he didn't named, name Moore as the assailant, as the guy who boxed him and punched him and knocked his, and knocked his eyesight out. Assailant probably isn't the right word there. <laughs> his sparring partner. He didn't, he didn't mention Moore by name. He just said that this happened, but Moore realized, based upon the description of the boxing match, oh, oh, this was me. I made the president go blind in one eye. And the president, being the sportsman that he is, never said anything about it. This was the character of Theodore Roosevelt, and this was what life was like in the White House during the seven and a half years of his administration. It was an, certainly an exciting time. And these events, coupled with all the things that Theodore Roosevelt did as president of the United States, made his presidency one of the most iconic presidencies in all American history. But as promised in 1908, Theodore Roosevelt said, I'm not going to run again for another term. And he endorsed his vice president to be the next president of the United States of America. His vice president was William Howard Taft, who was a progressive lawyer from Cincinnati, Ohio who later on was the governor of the Philippines. And then Theodore Roosevelt encouraged him to be uh, his vice president. He respected Taft for his accomplishments as a lawyer. He saw Taft as a fellow progressive. And Taft was, at heart, a progressive. He believed in the power of the federal government to curb corporate interest for the benefit of the people. But as Theodore Roosevelt left the presidency and William Howard Taft stepped into it, it became clear very early on that Taft did not have the boldness or the charisma or the energy of Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, very few people did. Taft also probably didn't want the job. Taft enjoyed being a lawyer, not a politician. So why was Taft in politics? Well, it was mostly because of his wife. Taft's wife, Helen, was really enamored by the celebrity of politicians. And she was really the dominant force in their relationship and really pushed her husband into politics. Helen Taft probably genuinely wanted to be a first lady. And William Howard Taft did his best to make his wife happy. After being president of the United States of America for seven and a half years, Theodore Roosevelt seeks adventure. So he goes on safari in Africa where he enjoys shooting large animals, like this elephant. After he kills animals, he has them shipped back to the United States of America so that the Smithsonian can put them on display. This is something that a lot of modern Americans just have difficulty reconciling. I certainly do. You've got Theodore Roosevelt, the preserver of lands, the create, the, a man who did so much to create the national park system, and yet he has no problem slaughtering animals 
And not just any animals, elephants, lion, bison, bear. Now, when he came back to the United States of America, there was one animal that he didn't want to shoot, and that was a bear in captivity. Theodore Roosevelt was visiting Mississippi, and a man who got to meet the president and knew that the president liked to hunt had in captivity for the president to shoot a black bear and said, here you go, Mr. President, you can shoot a black bear. And for Roosevelt, he was like, no, I can't kill a a, a bear in captivity. There's just something wrong about that. So he refused to shoot a black bear. And this became a popular story for the American press and a toy manufacturer decided to start making a child's toy that was inspired by this story. So Theodore Roosevelt was sometimes informally referred to as Teddy. And so this is the birth of the teddy bear. By the way, Theodore Roosevelt did not like being called Teddy. He didn't mind it if you called him TR, but he didn't like Teddy. And for what it's worth, he never really liked teddy bears. He thought it was a silly, foolish thing, a teddy bear. This particular image that I have on the screen here is completely photoshopped. Theodore Roosevelt spent a lot of time traveling after he was president of the United States of America. And when he came back to the United States, he, had fa- he found out that Taft, under pressure from the Republican leadership, was reversing some of the progressive gains that had been made under Theodore Roosevelt's administration. In short, Taft was becoming a traditional conservative Republican and was reversing all those progressive reforms. So when 1912 rolled around, Theodore Roosevelt decided to run for president again. At first, he ran as a Republican against his old running mate. He ran against Taft. And then in the summer of 1912, when the Republican Party selected Taft as their candidate, Theodore Roosevelt started a third party. This party was called the Progressive Party. It promoted workers' rights, unions, and women having the right to vote. The Progressive Party. But it got a new name when Theodore Roosevelt was asked if he had the energy to run for president and to be president once again, and Roosevelt responded repeatedly, I feel as strong as a bull moose. Well, then the Progressive Party got renamed the Bull Moose Party. Now, when you have a third party show up during an American election, chances are not very good that the third party candidate is going to win. But this third party candidate is going to take voters away from the other two major political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. And the big question is, which of the big two political parties is going to lose the most voters? So in 1912, is Theodore Roosevelt going to steal more Democratic voters or or more Republican voters? But 1912 was so different from most third party candidates because it's Theodore Roosevelt. He's so popular. He's already been president. When he throws his hat in the ring with this new progressive party, this new bull moose party, you know, there was real speculation that this is it. We're going to have a new political party that's going to be just as strong, if not stronger, than the Republicans or the Democrats and may actually knock out the Republicans or the Democrats. And in 1912, once again, Theodore Roosevelt is Theodore Roosevelt, barnstorming around the United States of America, giving speech after speech after speech. Famously, he was at a campaign stop in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was getting ready to give a speech. Lucky for him, he had written out this particular speech and he had it in his coat pocket. A mentally ill man walked up to Theodore Roosevelt and shot him in the chest. The bullet went through the papers and into his chest. Luckily, the speech slowed down the bullet a little bit, and that probably helped Theodore Roosevelt to survive the assassination attempt. But Theodore Roosevelt still stood up and gave a speech, two hours long, and proudly proclaimed, I have a bullet in my chest, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Much to the applause and the excitement of the crowd. Theodore Roosevelt was certainly an exciting candidate in 1912, but the Progressive Party, the Bull Moose Party, all it did was split the Republicans. There were the the Republicans that considered themselves to be progressive Republicans, And they became part of the Bull Moose Party. And then the other Republicans, the more traditional conservative Republicans that supported Taft, they were referred to as the Grand Old Party Republicans. Now that term, Grand Old Party or GOP, which we still associated with the Republican Party today, 
did not start with the election of 1912, but it certainly was accentuated in 1912 as Republicans split between progressive bull moose Republicans and the traditional Republicans, the GOP Republicans. But either way, the Republicans split. So in 1912, a Democrat is elected president, and that would be Woodrow Wilson, who himself cons would con considered himself a progressive president. Theodore Roosevelt lost. He will never again run for president. He's in his late 50s, and he finds that he's still hankering for adventure. He wants to do something daring and bold and adventurous. As he said at the time, this is my one last chance to be a boy. So here's what he decides to do. Theodore Roosevelt and his son Kermit gather together a small entourage of explorers to go to South America, specifically Brazil, to explore a tributary of the Amazon River that no human being has ever explored and made it back alive. So there's this river deep in the rainforest that anybody who has gone into has disappeared. And Theodore Roosevelt and his son say, hey, that's where we want to go. We want to be the first to explore this river. It's called the River of Doubt. So they get their stuff together, they head to South America, and they head down the River of Doubt. While they are exploring the River of Doubt, Theodore Roosevelt got extraordinarily sick. Malaria, yellow fever, something like that. He, began, he became delusional. He began just reciting poetry in a state of stupor. Specifically, the poem that he recited was Kublai Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Itself a very hallucinogenic poem. He told the men on the expedition to leave him behind, to let him die. But his son Kermit would not allow that. And sometimes the men had to take turns carrying the former president during the parts of the expedition where the boat couldn't pass along the water. But in the end, Theodore Roosevelt survived it. Here are just a few pictures. A picture of the boat along the River of Doubt. Here's a picture of Theodore Roosevelt with mosquito netting, writing in his journal. Another picture of the former president on the exploration. In the end, they all survived. They got to the end, the source of the River of Doubt, and the country of Brazil honored the former president of the United States by naming the river after him. The river Rio Teodoro. Theodore River. Roosevelt had survived the war, or I'm sorry, Roosevelt had survived the expedition, but his body was severely weakened after that. He never recovered his energies, the energy that he once had throughout his entire life. He was a much more weak old man after the exploration of the River of Doubt. Upon his return to the United States of America this time, the world was erupting into war. The First World War, the Great War, it was, as it was called at the time. When war broke out, Theodore Roosevelt, typical Theodore Roosevelt, believed that the United States of America should join on the side of the democratic powers, Britain and France, and help defend those countries against the expansion of Germany. Theodore Roosevelt was increasingly interested in getting the United States of America involved in the war when he found out that one of Germany's allies, the Ottoman Empire, was committing acts of genocide against Armenian Christians in Turkey. When Roosevelt found out about that, even more he wanted the United States of America to get involved in the Great War. He began giving speeches, encouraging Americans to put pressure on their government to get involved in the war. He openly called President Wilson a coward for not wanting the United States to go to war. In 1916, when Congress finally declared war against Germany, and it was Woodrow Wilson who encouraged Congress to declare war. So in other words, the federal government deciding, okay, we're going to get involved in this war. Theodore Roosevelt asked for President Wilson to once again give him a volunteer cavalry unit so that he could once again be a war hero. But Wilson said, no, absolutely not. This is a new industrial industrialized war. We've got machine guns. We've got heavy artillery, there are airplanes, flamethrowers. This is not going to be a charge up San Juan Hill. This is a completely different type of war. And Wilson honestly did not want the death of Theodore Roosevelt on his hands. So Roosevelt was denied the ability to participate in the First World War, to which he responded 
evidently, this is a very exclusive war. Theodore Roosevelt did not participate in the First World War, but his son Quentin did. His youngest son, Quentin. Quentin, who was so similar to Theodore Roosevelt in his temperament. Young Quentin, who wanted so much to be just like his dad. Here's a picture of the young, handsome man as a soldier in the First World War for the United States of America. He became one of the United States' first fighter pilots and, just like his dad, accepted some of the most dangerous missions of the war. And because of that, in 1918, Quentin Roosevelt died in the First World War. The news of Quentin's death reached Theodore Roosevelt when he was at Sagamore Hill. When the courier arrived, it was Theodore Roosevelt who took the piece of paper and first read the notification of his son's death. Here's that earlier picture of Theodore Roosevelt's family. Quentin Roosevelt is the boy who has his head on Theodore Roosevelt's shoulder in this picture. Theodore Roosevelt had to take a moment before he broke the news to his wife, fearing that it would devastate Edith, and surely that news would devastate any mom. But it was Theodore Roosevelt who was the most devastated. It wasn't but a few months after that that Theodore Roosevelt died in January of 1919. Theodore Roosevelt died likely because of how his body had been worn down during the exploration of the River of Doubt, and perhaps a little bit because of heartbreak from his son's death during the First World War. Theodore Roosevelt was only 60 years old when he died. So there's the full story of this man's life, or as full as I can tell it. Hopefully you acquired an honest portrait of this man. For our study of United States history, I hope you have a clear understanding of how Theodore Roosevelt strengthened the power of the executive branch, how he turned the presidency into a bully pulpit, how he used presidential power to be a trust buster, to negotiate the ends of strikes, to negotiate peace between foreign powers that were at war, how he helped to preserve lands that were wild and beautiful, and to establish more national parks than any president in United States history. And hopefully you can understand how Theodore Roosevelt redirected the course of the United States of America into becoming an empire. He did this both before and during his presidency, so that as the 20th century progressed, so would American power and influence across the world. And that is the story of Theodore Roosevelt. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. I certainly hope that you learned a lot. That's all for this time. I look forward to teaching you again sometime soon, United States history students. Have yourselves a wonderful day.